Tonight, we have a conversation with two graduates of this program, the MFA Fine Arts Program at SVA, Julie Schenkelberg and Paul Amenta. The conversation will be moderated by Anna Osier Bloomer, who's Assistant Director of Career Development here at SVA. Anna was raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. Mm -hmm. She got an MFA in Photography and Related Media from Parsons and a BFA from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where she was the recipient of the Yusuf Karsh Prize in Photography. She's exhibited at galleries and museums nationally, including the Bridge Art Fair in Miami, the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and at the Attleboro Arts Museum in Massachusetts. Her solo and two-person shows include uh, exhibitions in New York, Cincinnati, and Wellesley, Mass. She's received grants from Chashama in New York, the School of the Muse Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and CS Arts in Cincinnati. Her work's been published in Feature Shoot, Refinery29, Huffington Post, Bust Magazine, The Daily Mail, Red Book Magazine, and numerous other online publications. Anna is on the graduate faculty uh, at SVA, and she has been an adjunct assistant professor at uh, CUNY, City University of New York. Please join me in welcoming Julie Schenkelberg, Paula Menta, and Anna Osier Bloomer. Thank you, Mark. Um, thanks for letting me take over your class tonight. Thank you so much to your amazing staff, Allison, Pam, and Aya, um, for helping me put this together tonight. So um, tonight, I know some of you are students in the class, some of you are um, other guests. We're so excited that you're all here tonight. Uh, we're changing the format a little bit of the usual artist talk. Um, so I'm going to introduce our two guests this evening. And while I give you their, um, their bios, I'm going to show you some slides of their work, um, of their practice. And then we'll uh, sit down and have a conversation about what it really takes to create a sustainable arts practice. Because our two guests both um, are able to live off of their creative practices. So um, they're not doing a day, jo day job. They're you know, essentially living the dream. So we want to hear about how they've done this in very, very different ways. OK, so let me just launch into some slides here. OK. Um, so first, Julie Schenkelberg grew up in the post-industrial landscape of Cleveland, Ohio. Her mixed media installations start with furniture, dishware, textiles, and marble, combined with concrete, resin, and construction materials to transform notions of domesticity and engage with the American Rust Belt's legacy of abandonment and decay. Using the home as a playground for formal and conceptual subversions, the work aggressively disrupts cohesion within the physical sphere. Familiar furnishings rekindle memories or premonitions of collapse, suggesting both the utter destruction of war, calamities, or urban decay, but also the uncanny juxtapositions of fragile substances such as cloth and china with industrial materials such as rusty metal, heavy concrete, and tool-made marks like drilled holes and chainsawed indentations which she does entirely herself, I have to add. Um, Schenkelberg was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and splits her time between the Midwest and New York. She received a BA in Art History at the College of Worcester in Ohio, an MFA uh, and an MFA in Fine Arts here at SVA. She's represented by Asia Geisberg Gallery in New York, and her large-scale installations have been displayed in solo exhibitions at the Sculpture Center, the Mattress Factory Museum of Contemporary Art in Pittsburgh, which this image is from, um, Untitled Art Fair in Miami, Sight Lab in Grand Rapids, and many more. She's received numerous grants from institutions, including the Harpo Foundation, the Fry Foundation, Art Prize, the Slavic Village Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts, and has been a finalist for both the Joan Mitchell Foundation grant and the Knight Foundation grant. In 2014, she was awarded the $20,000 Jury Prize for Installation Art at Sight Lab and was just recently announced as the 2016 Ephraim Sind Contemporary Arts Fellow, a distinction that carries with it an award of $25,000. She's been an artist in residence at the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art, the Mattress Factory, the Myers School of Art at the University of Akron, and Oxbow. She's been visiting faculty at a number of institutions, including Rutgers University, Kendall College of Art and Design, the University of Akron, um, and is currently uh, on faculty at the College for Creative Studies uh, in Detroit. Coming up in 2017, she will have solo exhibitions at Projectrum Normans in Norway, Plug Projects in Kansas City, and Asia Geisberg in New York. And these are just a few more images from the recent piece that Julie did at SciLab with Paul.
Okay. Paula Menta was born in Hammond, Indiana, and attended Grand Valley State University, where he received a BA in sculpture and printmaking, sorry, BFA. He then earned an MFA in fine arts at the School of Visual Arts. He spent eight years here in New York and was represented by Marvelli Gallery. Amenta then returned to Grand Rapids in 2006, where he served as an adjunct professor at Kendall College of Art and Design, an experience that directly led to his forming the nonprofit Site Lab, a curatorial initiative that brings together outstanding installations, sculpture, and performance artists to create site specific works using abandoned structures in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Site Lab works closely with Habitat for Humanity to transform spaces and buildings slated for demolition. SiteLab recently received the Art Prize Award for Outstanding Venue for the fifth year in a row. Woohoo! And his own piece, Hybrid Structures, in this year's uh, iteration, a collaborative piece created with artist Alois Kronschleiger, another SVA alum, and Ted Lott, was a finalist in the Art Prize Juror Shortlist for installation. His creative practice has grown to include organizing large collaborative exhibitions and vacant structures in Grand Rapids, including active site projects, Michigan Land of Riches, and the numerous site lab projects. Amenta's work and site lab has, have been acknowledged in publications such as the New, York, the New Yorker, the New York Times, Art Forum, Art News, Art in America, Art Net, Hyperallergic, High Fructose, Sculpture Magazine, The Creators Project, Art Journal, and many more. Um, recently, Amenta received a grant from the Fry Foundation and a major grant from the National Endowment of the Arts Our Town program, which will be used to support Site Lab's educational initiatives. So, I'm very thrilled to have the two of you here, and let's, uh, let's have a conversation. Yeah. As many of you know, we're going to be using these mics, and they're not projecting our voices. Uh, it's a fake mic, so <laughs> we're going to speak very loudly so everyone can hear us. Um, and after we've had a bit of a conversation, we'll open it up to audience questions. So we do want to hear from you. And when that happens, we'll be sure to pass this mic. You do need to, to use that. Um, so just to get the conversation started off, since we do have a lot of current students or very fresh uh, students, uh, recent graduates in the room, um, can you talk a little bit about what that experience was like leaving graduate school and kind of how the, the next several years were formative for you or what, how your, your career kind of um, progressed? Well, I was thinking a lot about that question because I, I came to SVA as an older student, and so I was in my mid-30s, and I came with an experience, an eclectic experience of being out in the work world, having had an art history degree. And um, one thing was, was that I already had a skill that I could make use of after grad school. Um, I'm trained as a professional set painter for theater, so I went straight into production as soon as I got out of school, and um, I knew that it was going to be a rocky first year, so most of that time I spent making money and trying to make enough money to find a studio. Um, and that was that was the serious transition out of school. And a lot of my pra art practice as an artist began thinking, is this the place where I belong? Where do I make my work? Is my work about me and not where I make it? And those were questions that I began to develop, including applying to everything I saw. That, that was also something. Uh, first, thanks for having us here. Thank you to Anna for inviting us. And uh, it was a pleasure to meet some of you today in your studios. Thanks for inviting us. Um, for me, uh, that sort of crucial moment of coming out of grad school, um, out of SVA, which was uh, a really formidable time for me, um, I think back to this very unique moment where um, I no longer had the studio uh, here at school. Um, I was also, um, you all know JP, right? Um, uh, I studied with him, we were, uh, we were students together, but uh, we also were coworkers. I spent uh, uh, just over two years sharing that little office with him. Um, so I got to know him very well. Um, but in that moment of transition, so I got picked up by Marvella Gallery right out of grad school, which was exciting and, and amazing, um, but I didn't have a studio. So I would work from nine to five in that office, and uh, when JP would leave, um, I would push all of our desks together. Uh, Mark's uh, uh, predecessor, David Shirey, who was our chairman, I would push all three of our desks together, and that would be my studio. And I uh, co-opted that space for uh, about a year. Um, I produced two shows inside that, uh, ins inside that little office space up there. So 
that was my transition out of, uh, out of grad school. So um, I think the moral of that story is you do whatever it takes you know, to make the work. I think that's a, a really good point that you, you do have to do whatever it takes and both of you have done that in so many ways. So um, what are the ways in which you've been able to now sustain your practice over the last several years? Um, how did those methods lead to new work that you've made or new opportunities? I think you know, for Julie it might be um, more about your own production and Paul, um, the formation of a nonprofit and curatorial endeavors. A sustainable art practice. Oh, <laughs> it's a big question. I mean, um, all of a sudden we realize we were born into this, right, at one point. So um, by the time you get out of grad school, you're like, okay, I am an artist. I'm totally committed to this. I picked this program. I picked this medium. Um, and I realized that there were going to be a couple of years of just figuring it out and figuring out still who I was as a person and um, luckily I came out of the school with a good sense of the story I was telling as an individual and that was the strongest part that carried me over the next I guess it's only been five years but um, sort of New York is like that it takes you and it polishes you down to exactly what you want to be or where you should be and um, for my practice, I continued. It be one point I really want to make here is that there is not one way to be an artist, and that's something that I mean we're programmed as in our gender or in our practice, and it you can be even on the outside of what's normal as an artist, and that was one thing that I found about the way I treated my medium, my space. Um, where I di identified where I was from, um, those things became more real being in this space. And um, I, they would start to frustrate me and I'm like, I just wanna fit into the art world. Isn't this where I go into the art world, like a puzzle piece? And it's absolutely not true. Our, as unique as our practices are, is as unique as the path is. So that's what I sort of spent a couple of years being like, which direction am I going? And I figured out I don't need a studio all the time because um, one thing is, is I am my studio and I also have a pad of paper at my hand at all times. Those ideas aren't going anywhere as long as I'm making some kind of mark. So I figured out how to move money around really well as we do here, um, whether it be subletting the various spaces that I had. Um, you know, or um, what became fascinating about my practice was you think as an artist, I did, I was like, oh, I'm wasting my time doing all this administrative work. I'm wasting my time taking the subway to my job. Well, I turned all those into interesting opportunities as to what I did want to do and constantly working those problems out. Um, I had a fascinating job. I worked in production here I used to run scene shops um, before I came to New York, um, major productions with lots of scenery. I was in charge, and um, I was in charge of every surface that went on the set, so I, I was used to organizing things, and I had my own methods of organization. So over time, I began to like go back to my roots and figure out why can't I apply this to my practice? These are things that serve me well in my job. And so I would do commuting around the city to production jobs, like I painted sets for Marc Jacobs. Um, I did things for Lady Gaga here. I did productions that went into the Guggenheim. And it would, I would laugh because I'd be like, I'm totally on the outside, behind the scenes. I painted that thing and it's in the Guggenheim. And it was like maybe a black shiny surface for like a cocktail party. And I mean, I'm sure, uh, others of you are involved in this world too, in fashion and photography. So I was really disgruntled with that. And after a while, I was like, this is cool. Like, and then I would get a project. I would either, um, I did have the good fortune of being picked up by Asia Geisberg Gallery. And I've been with her, this is my seventh year. So um, I always knew that I had a show coming up with her. 
but where I was going to build it, what material I was going to use, those were things I didn't know. But those became secondary because I knew I always had the idea. So once I had the idea, I would find the materials, the space, the money. And I think that's, that's what I want to stop with. Yeah. So sustainable practice, right? That was the, that's, that's the context of this. So for me, it really was an issue of, of just survival versus a sustainable practice. I mean, um, for four years out of grad school, I was with a gallery I showed regularly. I um, you know, even sold work on occasion. Um, even enough work to quit my job uh, with JP. I had to say goodbye to JP, which was sad. And, uh, <laughs> um, but I got to work in the studio for a couple years, and then I got dropped like a hot potato from the gallery. And I had no other leads. You know, I wasn't, uh, I thought it was sort of the gallery's job to sort of take care of me in that sense of what was gonna happen next, right? Like opportunities. And I realized that he really wasn't doing that sort of thing. And so I had to take it on, upon myself and I had to sort of, in, in many ways, sort of reteach myself how to survive out in the world. So I was applying for everything and you know, you'd make it to a finalist on something and, and you wouldn't get it. Um, and then I started turning towards, um, towards teaching uh, to earn an income, uh, had a unique opportunity Opportunity. Uh, one of my, um, he wasn't a classmate of mine, but we overlapped uh, in grad school, Joe Fig, who was running the, um, the summer residency program uh, in the sculpture department, invited me to teach a class. Uh, he, he called me one day and said, you know, one of the faculty dropped out. This was a week before the semester started, and he asked if I would be interested in taking the class, and I said, absolutely not. I have no interest in doing this. Uh, I'm not interested in teaching, and he just begged me, and then finally I gave in and uh, realized um, it seemed like, uh, one, I enjoyed it, seemed like the students were getting something out of it. So uh, I decided to sort of look into that as an opportunity. Uh, a couple more opportunities came my way. I uh, snatched them up, and, uh, and then so I was starting to build this teaching resume. And then I was offered this teaching job in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is where I'm from, or, 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 or I lived for a good chunk of my life. And it was a one-year temporary full-time gig, and I thought it would help me build my resume a little bit. So I took it with plans of moving back here immediately after. And they kept hiring me back year after year. Uh, uh, about eight years went by. <laughs> I was still living in GR. So uh, what I realized, if I was going to stay there, I had to find a strategy to sort of survive as an artist, do the things that I wanted to do. There's obviously not the art market in Grand Rapids like there is here in New York. There's not the opportunities for somebody who does site-specific interventions like there are here and other places. So I had to basically invent that, that category uh, of, 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 of opportunity. So um, along with a couple students, we found a, uh, a 10,000 square foot uh, abandoned space. We uh, mounted an exhibit, invited all of our friends and family to it, and uh, 500 people showed up to a, um, a one-night opening of site-specific work, mostly student work, and I thought I might have hit on something here in this region. So I just uh, I kept doing these projects. I was doing two or three projects a year, and they just kept growing exponentially each year. I was able to raise more funds and so on, and that sort of has sustained me or sustained my survival as a site-specific artist uh, in the Midwest, and it's created lots of opportunities for me moving forward. That's great. So you sort of already answered uh, part of my next question, but I'd, I'd love to hear about an opportunity or an experience or connection that you made that led to a really exciting, um, you know, step forward or another opportunity. Um, and maybe what are the, big, the biggest challenges that you have faced um, working to create and, and maintain that studio practice as a, the center of your professional life? Yeah. <laughs> I think about all the people I've ever met that have helped me, and it's hard to remember all of them, which, I mean, I think one thing I was talking to people about today is that, like, maybe you'll never find that one person that you think is going to pull you through everything. It's actually yourself, and then people just kind of, like, pinball you along, and then you figure it out, because you don't need them that long, like, because you can do it. Um, but one opportunity that really changed my art practice after SVA was, um, well, I began to learn how to apply to things. And like, you know, I had a lot of problems with writing in college. And I was like, now I'm writing again, years and years later. And, but I, like, 
it's just sort of like an art practice. I just refine, refine, refine. And um, eventually I was trying for all the residencies that all of us try for, thousands of us apply for. Um, and I got the Bemis Center in Omaha. And that changed my practice because I left SVA. And I think you really need time to process what you did there and space and a quiet place to unplug from that and like say, okay, this worked for me, this didn't, I still hear this voice. Um, and it opened up my installation process because I had limitless space in Omaha. It's, it's a residency in Omaha that um, loves artists. There's funding, there's lots of space. I'm, I'm from the Midwest, I'm from Cleveland, as we've stated, so it felt familiar to be in a space like that. And to put me back in this imaginary, familiar space just like projected my work to another place. So it was like I was almost not afraid to go back home into myself. And when I came back to New York, everyone was like, I don't understand this work you're doing, the color, it's crazy. And I was really disappointed, but this was the work that propelled what I do now. And now um, it's catching up, it's kind of popular sometimes, but. <laughs> Um, and it's also the work that um, Paul saw and in eventually invited me to come to Sight Lab. So. Yeah, sort of riffing off uh, Julie's response a little bit, um, that, that, that project that she did at the Bemis Center. Um, I went to grad school with her, her gallery dealer, Asia Geisberg, and uh, I had worked with one of her artists on a previous project, and she um, introduced me to Julie's work and uh, she showed me uh, images on her site, and uh, I just wasn't that intrigued by what Asia was showing me, and then I reached out to Julie, and she showed me all these images from her Bemis show project, and I thought, oh, now I get what Asia was talking about, and that's, that's what sort of s sparked the conversation um, with Julie and I. Um, we've been working together ever since then. Um, but to that question of, of opportunities, um, uh, it's, and, and, and sort of specific opportunities, uh, like Julie's uh, response as well, there are so many things that sort of come your way over the course of, a, you know, for me now 15, 16 years since I've been uh, out of grad school. Um, and I always sort of tell people that I, I really look at anything that comes my way as the potential of changing the trajectory of, of, of my career, of my life, of my practice. Um, and, and I really pay attention to things. Even back when I was a grad student, I, I think back to um, uh, when we had studio, you know, artists come to give talks and, and studio visits. I remember David Warner came uh, to give a talk and nobody signed up for a studio visit with him and I'm thinking like what the hell are you guys doing so I signed up for like two or three slots and I had he sat in my studio for like an hour and a half and it was incredible I mean do you guys know who this guy is I'm right <laughs> please nod your heads like this um, I sat in my studio with David Warner for an hour and a half having an incredible conversation he was super engaged with my work I mean these are opportunities you can't take for granted. So, you know, the moral of that story is jump on all those things and take them seriously because they can really change the trajectory of, of a career. And I saw it happen all the time to, uh, you know, colleagues and, and classmates. Um, it happens all the time. Um, but one particular, um, uh, I'll, I'll just point one out. Um, I was introduced to the director of the Grand Rapids Public Art Museum uh, in 2009 when I was teaching at Kendall College of Art and Design. And uh, it was a very casual sort of meeting or, or introduction. And uh, um, I sort of followed up with an email and ended up having a meeting with him. And uh, over the course of that half an hour meeting, um, I had the key to an abandoned natural history museum that had been closed to the public for 20 years. And I had access to that building for over two years, did four projects in that building and worked with um, probably 150 artists uh, over the course of those two years. So it was a really exciting project and it came from a very casual introduction that I followed up on and uh, you know, I just sort of um, blurted out this question of whether or not I could have access to this building and somehow it happened. And so, you know, sort of noticing when there's an opportunity in front of you n not to be afraid to go for it. Yeah, I think that's great advice to, to be open to all kinds of new opportunities, even though you might not have an idea of where they might go. 
Um, that's really exciting, yeah. So the next thing I want to talk about is networking, <laughs> which is, um, I, I would say that it's the single most important um, part of an artist's professional development. Um, I prefer to use the term community building rather than networking because I really think it's, it's not about just finding someone who will help you climb some kind of invisible ladder, but rather extending and building your own co community, whether it's creative or professional. So. Um, you know, you have to do this to get out into the world, meet people, you have to be your own agent, um, your own publicist, your own advocate. Um, can you share some strategies that each of you has utilized to engage in community building in your career? Uh, there's so many fun stories behind that. <laughs> like, um, I mean, we, we try all different ways to meet people, or you think if I don't meet this person, it's not gonna work out for me, or um, I don't know, I, I mean, I can be pretty awkward but I will, no, <laughs> I'll go for it. Anyways, like over time, I'm just like, I'm just doing this. And you know, I walk up next to somebody, I'm like, just standing there. But um, <laughs> over time, it's like gotten better. And um, like, I can give you a recent example of what happened. Um, I was a finalist for this foundation grant in Detroit called the Knight Foundation. And what I did was um, I was invited to a meeting and I went to the meeting with all the finalists and I saw the vice president and I just went up to her and, and I was like too intimidated to talk to her and the line was too long but I just stood there and looked at her. And then you know what happened? I find this happens a lot is you get a second chance and it's really weird. So um, we're back in Grand Rapids this, this was happening in Detroit, and during Art Prize, um, there, there was a panel of all the um, deans of art student, art colleges in Grand Rapids. They were coming to see Art Prize, and I was asked to speak as an artist who had participated in, in this event. And so I was speaking to these people, and the thing's over, and I'm looking down, I'm like, oh, that person that I just stood next to awkwardly is speaking next. And so I'm like, okay, I have a grant that is up for proposal, for evaluation. I'm like, this is a great moment. So I found out where she was. I went to where she was. She was totally alone, preparing for her speech. And she looks up and she's like, you look so familiar. And I'm like, why yes, I was that awkward person that you didn't meet. <laughs> so um, then she began talking to me. She's like, you know, I'm so bored. I don't want to give this speech. So. Um, tell me about your project again. And so we started talking. I said, you know, I really don't want to take your time. I just wanted to, to say hello. And she's like, well, what are you doing in Grand Rapids? I said, well, I'm, I'm a participant in Art Prize and I work with the um, group Sight Lab. And she's like, well, I want to come see Sight Lab and I want to see your project. And so it just went on from there. And I said, okay, meet me there at this time. And then it turns into a private hour of giving her a tour and then follow up emails. and. That, that's just one of the unusual things that has happened to me because I've thought, oh, this is, oh, this is going terrible, terrible. One time I um, went to an opening in the Bronx and I thought this curator would like my work and the same thing, I went up to her, I introduced myself awkwardly, you know, no idea who I am and she actually called me the next day but not because I met her but because I was on her list of people to call about my work and that was a really strange coincidence. So she didn't remember me the day before, but that was better. So. Yeah, this whole networking thing, I mean, it's totally crucial, right? I mean, um, you know, even when you don't want to go up and talk to somebody, you absolutely have to. I have, I have absolutely no fear of going up to people and talking to them, even if it's a totally awkward scenario at all. I mean, I used to be terrified, but now I just don't give a shit at all, zero. Um, uh, so a couple... There's one story I wanted to tell that sort of ties my undergraduate activity in uh, with somebody I bumped into recently from, from those good old days. So one of my first jobs when I was here in New York was working at Art in General uh, uh, in Chinatown. And I was the preparator. And the first curator that I worked with was Gregory Volk. And he was you know, sort of an up and coming curator. He was doing this really interesting show. And, and I was there helping him install this thing. And, um, you know, had drinks with them, dinner, that sort of thing over the course of that project. And then we sort of lost touch and, you know, through social media sort of reconnected. But he was brought in uh, through this organization, Art Prize, which is this event that Sight Lab participates in as a venue. 
and uh, he was there doing this critical discourse panel discussion to talk about some of the winners or people who were nominated. And uh, he now writes for Art, Art in America. And you know, I, I went right up to him. I said, Gregory, you might not remember me. You know, told him the whole story, how, how I worked with him. He totally remembered who I was. We had this great conversation. And he went on and on about Julie's project and uh, talked a lot about um, what he thought about SiteLab and um, you know, wants to reconnect. And, and so there was like this 16-year gap in our, in our uh, you know, sort of communication, but he remembered immediately who I was based on, on that sort of trigger. Um, and, and, and then beyond that, any opportunity that I have, um, you know, to go and talk to somebody that can, um, you, know, m you know, potentially create an opportunity in the future, I, I have, you know, zero fear of going up to. Um, the other thing I sort of wanted to mention was, you know, everybody here in this room, you're all part of a network and you will probably play crucial roles in one another's careers moving forward. There's a couple of people sitting in here that, uh, that I knew from the good old days that I'm still in communications with, collaborate with, work with, create opportunities for, and it goes both ways. It's really crucial to establish those relationships and, um, and, and remember how important they are uh, in terms of your career. They'll, they're priceless. So part of why I asked the two of you to come is because you do have very different personalities um, and networking can feel like a very difficult thing for someone who's more introverted. Um, I would love to hear, you sort of talked about this a little bit, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about how your different personality types have maybe challenged your um, career, but also supported it or benefited you. Let's see, well, um, I don't drink very much. And <laughs> that could be seen as a problem in the art world. But um, I've made it work for me. <laughs> so um, I just get wound up and talk she to She drinks people. cider sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. So a lot of times what I do is if I'm going to an event and there's someone I really want to talk to, I watch everyone else talk to them. And I watch people get drunk and talk to them. And then I wait until things kind of calm down. And then I go and talk to that person and have a meaningful, intelligent conversation with them. And <laughs> they remember. So <laughs> that, that works out. Um, I'm trying to think of other things. And, and, and sometimes I just take my time building a relationship. And that's also important. I'm not sure how to talk about my personality. I'm, I think you're just saying Julie's nice and, and I'm not or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that's what you were getting no, at. No, <laughs> no, but I think like, that you're not at all afraid to, to go up and talk to anybody. And yeah. I think that's um, an amazing quality that a lot of artists don't possess but wish that they well, did. Well, it certainly wasn't always the case. I mean, um, you know, Can you I talk just about how you had to work at that then? Yeah, yeah, I had to get over it, like get fucking over it, people. Like go up and talk to people. <laughs> like Julie's created a strategy. It's taken her a while, but she's figured it out. Like you got to do it. Um, I mean, it didn't come easy in the beginning. You know, I was sort of the wallflower in the, in the good old days. But you know, you just got to get over it, and you got to go out there and do your thing and sell yourself. You have to be your biggest advocate. I mean, 100%. Um, and, and then hopefully you have other people supporting that. But, you know, it's really up to you guys. So, um, you know, get out there, pound the pavement, talk to people. It's not that hard once you get over it. You get over right, the Julie? hump, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I think, yeah, well, I'll save it for later. <laughs> So both of you are clearly excellent at obtaining grants and other sources of funding. Um, and that's something that all artists have to be working at all the time, right? That job, that part of your job doesn't stop. Um, it can be very difficult, you know, from finding time to do the applications, researching, improving your writing skills. Um, so can you tell us how you've made this a part of your schedule, how you manage doing that um, and your practice and all the other things that you have to do in your daily life? I think we were talking about this not that long ago, and we were both talking about clamping down on the pro procrastination. That's not cool anymore. <laughs> like, it's just not. Like, you, it's your like effing life. And if you want it, you got to go get it. You got to like plan your day around it. And that's like I'm like being very 
about it, but it's true. It's like there's no reason why you can't fit in like some massive grant application to your life. Like, um, I don't know the times I've done stuff. I've just like, okay, you can only clean for this long and then you're gonna sit down. Like, and I go through the internet and find what, a, what is important to me or um, it's taken like eight or nine years to figure out what, what it is I wanna work on. Um, and then I find I've been applying for things for that I don't actually want for years, that I think, oh, I want this on my resume, and then I am like hear more and more about people who've done it, I'm like, I don't think that fits into my life right now. And that's a really big lesson to learn, is like, I want this prestigious award, I want it, I want it, and it doesn't apply to you at all. Like something else is much more fitting to you, maybe you've never even heard of. And so I've started to take that attitude about how can I maintain my practice in this, in this way, like maybe there's a small foundation that wants to support my work that will propel it forward. And years from now, maybe that's an appropriate award for me. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, it's, it, it's about building it into your, into your daily practice. I mean, um, I, um, with the nonprofit that I'm a part of, uh, there's uh, a handful of people that, that are involved in certain things, and there is a person that's sort of more dedicated towards doing that activity but it is something you constantly have to be searching out for the right fit, you know, whether it's a grant application or, or a residency or whatever. I do less of that stuff now. Uh, it's more grant focused, um, but also I do a lot of private fundraising and uh, you know, finding the right person you know, to go and ask for money and, and sort of you know, going in there and sitting across uh, from a boardroom table uh, across from a billionaire asking for money like that's you know stuff that you have to sort of work up to it's not something that that you're you, you become good at immediately and you know you've learned over time uh, also something that's helped me personally is I've been asked to be on a lot of panels reviewing these things and you learn what works and what doesn't work just by seeing a lot of them right so that process has really helped me sort of fine tune tune my skills whether that's writing the proposal or choosing the right visual components uh, to sell the project um, I think is really important and you just get better over time but you have to do it and you have to do lots of it and you get lots of no's you know so you get used to hearing no a lot and then every now and again you get lucky and, and get a yes I, th I think one thing I was making a no about too is like as you develop your practice everyone's like oh rewrite your artist statement well I don't know, I go through and write like a paragraph every couple months, I reevaluate like what's going on, like does this apply, does this not apply? And then all of those builds up, build up of language is something you can like insert in anything you need, so. Yeah, I cut and paste a lot. So, so the flip side is how do you deal with all the rejection? I have a friend who calls his art applications pending rejections, just to psychologically psych himself down from, from getting things. How, how, do, how do you deal with that? I guess I always just assume it's gonna be a no, so when it comes in as a yes, it's a surprise. You know, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know, I don't get too wigged out about it. There's a couple grants that we were finalists for, and then your mind starts to like, oh, we, we, <laughs> we were a finalist for a million dollar Bloomberg grant. And it's like my mind started to wander what I could do with that money, which is kind of cool to think about. We didn't get it, so it was a little tweaked, but I let myself sort of get wound up about it. So I usually don't think too much about it. I'd, I'd have to say so too, especially with residencies. And then it gets time for them to tell you, and then you're like, oh, I can't fit that in my life, even if I got it. But um, I think the ones that come through are totally applicable to you and then you're ready for it. Like some you apply for, you're like, oh, I totally, yeah, no. So next I was gonna ask each of you to just talk about kind of your own time frame and, and um, how you sort of manage um, the year and the short term and the long term and applying for things, you know, um, Paul applying for grants or doing this private fundraising, you're planning for the next iteration of Site Lab now, I'm sure, or already were, you know, for the past year for next year. Um, so if, if you could talk about that a little bit, that'd be great. Just a little time management, maybe? Time management. Uh, mm, I just, I'm doing stuff 24 seven. I mean, it's every day, seven days a week, 
Um, I, I, I'm never not doing it. So I'm constantly thinking about it, working on a project, developing the next project, writing the grant, f you know, fundraising, um, traveling, looking for the artists I want to work with, collaborating, doing my own work. And it's all sort of, I mean, it, when I talk about these things, it's really all an extension of my creative practice. I really don't define these things as different things. It's all part of that nebulous creative practice. Um, I'm probably not a great time manager in that sort of specific way. Like I don't do something on Monday and do s something different on Tuesday. I'm doing the stuff all the time, constantly. Um, and then I work with a group of really great people uh, that, that do things that they're really great at. So um, over time, in the beginning, I used to do everything myself. And now I've sort of built up this community or team of core team uh, that sort of uh, is in charge of, of of things that they're all really good at, which allows me to do the things that I'm really good at. And I don't have to worry about, you know, um, you know, I guess grant writing isn't my greatest skill and we have a person that's a little bit better at it than I am, so, or the graphic design or whatever. Um, but it allows me to focus on the things that I excel at. And Julie, so you have several solo shows coming up. You have grants that are in the works. You have other ones you're applying for soon. You have, you know, three shows next year. So how, what's kind of your short and long-term kind of planning process for all that? Um, well, in the last few years, I've gotten busy. And I had one year that was very busy, and I sort of gauged what I could handle or not handle. And it was a year where I got up every day, and I'm like, if I don't keep moving, this is not going to work. So that, that was very intense, and um, that was everything from um, building to moving to um, writing and figur figuring everything out for the shows I was doing that year. And so I sort of can understand how long of time period I need in between each show and what, what could I can make that's still a good piece for um, a show. And... Um, I, I think I've figured it out that I can only handle three large installations a year, or they don't have to be that large. They can be interesting and not gigantic. Um, I have I work with Ostia Geisberg Gallery, and um, you still have to do your work. You still it's it's your career is really up to you. You say yes, you say no, you figure it out. Um, usually, you're telling your gallery. I can handle this, I can't handle this. Um, and I, th I think that you end up understanding that you're your biggest supporter. Like Paul was saying, you have to be your own advocate. And then you figure out that um, you need backup plans. Even when there are systems in, in place, you still need a backup plan behind that in terms of money or resources, people that are gonna help you. So um, I'm still figuring it out, but it's going more smoothly. So my last question is uh, just what advice would you give to emerging artists or mid-career artists um, on career sustainability or, or any aspect of this? Do I write down any advice in here? What do you got, Julie? Let's see. <laughs> I think She's I got have, stuff written I think down. I had some. She's got stuff written uh, down that looks serious. Oh yeah, yeah. It says, well, one of the things is, you know, like find your people. Like <laughs> that's what people always say, but whatever. It's true. <laughs> um, ah, that means like like finding your community that you can feel understood in. And that helps you kind of relax into who you need to be as an artist. And um, I've been fortunate to work with Paul and his organization for a while. And um, that's a place where I've been able to become an artist I want to be. And through working with him and um, the members that he's talking about in, in his organization, uh, I mean, that could be, I also have a nice network here in New York, too. But to do my practice, I found I needed a, like a second layer of, of people or place. It was also a place. And, um, wow, I do have good advice. Where is it? <laughs> oh, I think 
One thing is like working on your personal um, security. If you can find that, then like you're going to propel your f practice forward because you're going to believe in it. Um, how you're going to do that is up to you. It's not necessarily about money, but that's important. Um, feeling about yeah, feeling confident about your work and yourself. If you're a, pro a, a huge, I mean, a lot of us don't necessarily maybe believe in yourself, but you believe in your work, which is actually who you are. So you get behind that, and it'll become really clear what you can do. Um, the other thing is, like, don't worry about what everyone else is doing. I mean, <laughs> we're all totally different. And you see that in graduate school. I'm talking about that weird competition thing, that it's good and healthy, but what's good for you is absolutely not good for someone else. And, you know, try, like, giving an opportunity over to another friend who you know it's more beneficial to them, that's cool. Um, what else is there? Uh, you know, even the art world is conventional, so get outside of it. That's a good one. Um, something that I always tried to do, and, and I sort of, w when I look back, I realized I've been doing it for a long time, is I've always tried to put myself around people that are serious about their practice. Um, I always tried to be near people who were smarter than me, harder working than me, more motivated than me, because I wanted to model my practice after pe serious people. So I stopped hanging out with people who were not doing work, who weren't serious about this, or whatever, you know. So I, I just took it very seriously. I took myself very seriously, I took my practice very seriously, and I only put myself around people who were focused, determined, dr driven, and, and I and I used to tell that to all, particularly like freshman uh, undergraduates, like you gotta surround yourself with people who can drive you, right? If you're not self-motivated, you have to find people who can help motivate you. And uh, so uh, any advice I can offer is, you know, find those people who take you seriously and who you take their practice seriously and, um, you know, stay near them, um, you know, find new people like Julie, hang out with them. And, uh, you know, th they'll help pr propel your own practice uh, as well. That's great. So before we turn it over to the audience, do you, either of you have anything else you want to add or mention? I think that was a lot of really helpful information. Thank you. So we'd love to take audience questions now. Aya is going to pass the mic around. You definitely have to talk into it. Hi. Is this recording? Is that why I'm talking into it? Okay, cool. Um, Julie, can you talk a little bit more specifically? I, I was in the same class with Julie. We're, we're good friends. But I think it would be helpful. Um, I, I know something about Julie you don't, which is that she has a very gentle networking style. So she's not going to parties and just meeting people to meet people. She has a very directed approach. Um, and I, I want to talk about your gentle networking style from, I have two, two ways of thinking about it. The first one is, Julie was the first person in our class to be represented by a gallery, which brought about a lot of negative um, competition with your classmates, um, which was a problem. And, and, and your, your response to networking was not, you, you didn't want to just have a gallery, you were dedicated to your work. And the other thing I'm thinking of is um, we used to crash MoMA parties together, um, and um, you wouldn't, we wouldn't, we would go, but um, it wasn't just to schmooze. We went to, the, we, okay, I was to schmooze, but like you wouldn't just go up and talk to anybody. You'd see someone and say, okay, this person has collected my work, or I met them at this event, and it was very directed. It's not just general, see, you know, being out to be seen. I, I sort of forgot about what happened when I got my gallery. Um, what happened was I, en I built my first solo show here, in, like you were talking about, Paul, um, my s third semester. And um, it fit in with the work that I was doing here, but uh, I forgot about that. And <laughs> um, I did receive a lot of um, negative 
uh, emotions toward my direction. And so what I did was I just ignored it. I mean, I felt bad about it for sure, but I was like, this, this is not what I'm focusing on. This is, this is my future. This is my life. Um, this is special for me right now. It's, it will be special for them later in some other environment. And so I, I just went for it. I'm like, this is not going to distract me from anything. I'm doing this. This is what I want. This is why I came here. Um, but it's true. Like, I, I do have a very gentle style and approach. I mean, clearly there's a contrast in my personality to the, the gutturalness, the viciousness, the beauty in my work. So um, the contrast is my approach with people. And um, I just found it meaningful to when I went to a party or going somewhere to find somebody that was interesting that I could talk to, be like, you might find me interesting, you might like my work, or I might learn something from someone. And that was always something what I was looking for. I'm like, not necessarily do I want something from this person, they might be able to help me, but that they could tell me something fascinating. Thank you, Cindy. I have a question for you guys, real quick. So, so when I was a grad student here, um, there was this real palpable sense that at any moment, uh, a dealer or a curator could walk into the studios and like snatch you up. There was almost this, this was in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, gallery dealers were grabbing young uh, MFA grads or students um, right out of grad school, and there was almost this sort of f like feeding frenzy thing that was going on. So we all thought like at any second somebody could walk in and change the trajectory of your art career, um, e even while you were a student. And, and it was happening all around us. Um, and, and I was lucky enough to, to get picked up uh, by a gallery in that moment. I'm just curious, is, is, is the art market like that here now? Do you guys have that sense? Do you guys think about those things? Do you care about the market? Do you care about curators and dealers coming through your studios at all? What's it like now? <laughs> Just anybody can answer that. I'm sorry? I don't think it's the same Good. climate. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Just, just more out of curiosity. I just remember, like, it, I always thought of my studio as like, I treated it like a gallery. Like it was my studio. I made stuff in there, but it always looked like stuff was presented. Because like even, like our studio open studio events. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the mic. Our open studio events were packed and people freaked out over how their studio looked like we put a lot of effort and energy into that because um, i mean you would just see like holy crap so and so just got picked up from team gallery tonight like it was happening like it was really amazing and sort of scary and you know a lot of things that julie talked about people were pissed that, did, what how did they get a gallery you know those sorts of conversations and competitiveness to answer that, I think that there is some pressure to make your space kind of look like a gallery, but I think we're also encouraged not to make it feel like a gallery and to do what we want with our space, because it is a working space. But I think that there's also that pressure to um, make it look like an installation that's professional. And um, sometimes it's just not doable with the spaces that we have. but. Um, yeah, I don't think that there's that same sense that we're going to get picked up by somebody at any moment. It feels like it's more of a longer haul type feel. Like you'll meet a curator and they'll put you in touch with somebody. And at least for me, that's more of how I look at it. I don't know. It might be different for other people. Uh, how about to put it this way? I think in many ways we can tell about outfield before economic crisis and after economic crisis. In many ways, art is like luxury brands. 
the fancy things. It's not essential for life. It's essential for life to us, but I think in some ways, in or for many people, it's just a kind of opportunity to earn money or like a lottery. So I know it sounds so sarcastic or yeah, cynical, but yeah, I think more like that. Uh, so, y so you guys don't have that that sort of competitive sort of impulse to sort of uh, continually outdo one another. Yeah, well that, yeah, that seems a little malicious. There is <laughs> there is an underlying pressure that I feel like constantly, whether it's like played out through my anxiety of mm -hmm. my God, like I have to do this, I have to prepare for the studio because. is important. Um, but I actually have another question. Um, so you guys stress, you've mentioned resume a lot and how you strive, like especially early on, you strive to build that. Um, but how do you handle situations that might come your way, but then you realize, even like as an emerging artist, that it's not after maybe having done some research on this situation, you know, in, in terms of like who is offering you an opportunity, but then you get to after, because we have the internet, so we can like research who is giving us the opportunity, and then you find that it's not really to your liking. It like, how do you manage like, early on, like what could be like missed opportunities, but you perceive them to be bad ones that could affect, is it like crazy to have too much unnecessary foresight if it's like not Oh, I think there's a big learning curve to all this stuff, and I, I would say Julie and I probably, uh, well, I'll speak for myself, I certainly haven't figured it all out yet, you know. Um, uh, I used to say yes to a lot of things. Now I'm in an opportunity where I get to say no to things, and, and, and not because they're maybe not good opportunities, but because I have enough good opportunities or opportunities that I feel are, are much more interesting to me personally or to the, you know, trajectory of, of, of my career or something. Um, but then you get yourself in situations like, mm, maybe I should have said no to this one. But you know, again, it's it's a learning curve. I, I, you know, I, I think you have to look at the opportunities and you know, researching them and you know, talking to people. Uh, um, you know, I've worked with people who probably won't work with again, and lots of people who I would gladly work with again. And you know, it just takes time. I, what I'd say to that is. Um, there's things I s have said yes to, and then they've come up uh, months later or even a year later, and then I get into it and I'm like, oh, this was what I, I, I this is not it, but this was what I would have liked a year ago. And it's sort of like, um, there, there was a teaching opportunity I had that somebody made specifically for me, and once I got in it, I was like, oh yeah, this would have fit me a while ago. But it was a good, it was good in the end because it reminded me to like move faster and f farther forward. Like, okay, I'm definitely about this thing over here. This retaught me that. So in those environments, I felt like, okay, this really solidifies what I want. Um, and then other times you, if it's like doesn't match your ethics in a really bad way, I wouldn't do it. But if you could figure out how to make it work, even if it's like, I'd say even if it's 60% possible, I'd do it in the beginning. Okay. So I want to respond first to your question, Paul, about competition. Uh, being removed now for a couple months from graduating in 2016, my class was very close, but there was a great deal of competition, whether or not people outwardly said it. 
And I don't think that competition is bad. I think you need that competition because that competition pushes you to do better. So the idea that now that competition could be frowned upon, I think, is actually really bad. It should be fostered. Like, you want to know that the person who's in the studio next to you is looking at your work and wants to do work better than you, and you want the same. Because, you know, I, I may not... Uh, just because I, I want to be better than this person doesn't mean I don't want that person to succeed. Because if they succeed, then I succeed. So I would encourage you guys to push each other and have competition. It's needed. Uh, my, second, my second thing is for, for Julie. Uh, you talked about, you've been talking about your schedule for next year and how you have these three shows coming up. And so my question is, do you think about these shows uh, simultaneously or do you sort of take them each as they go sort of in a chronological order. So I'll work on this show first. Once that's completed, I'll start on the second one, and vice versa. Or are you kind of always in the act of working on all three, and how much time do you budget for each show? I think he was asking me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was a two-part question. One response. One response? OK, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Um, well, um, how do I budget that time? Well, I already know what I want to do in one place. Like, that happens to me sometimes immediately. And and then I draw it out. And that's um, my show for ASEAN 2018 and, like, the very end of 2017. And, um, and that comes on the end of another show, like... You know how you're working on a piece and you're like, okay, I'm going to do this. And then you're like, wait, this is, wait, you're in the middle of it. And you're like, wait, that's for the next piece. And then, so sometimes my pieces are like that. They're very chaotic, but then I can draw them and say, this is what I'm going to do. Um, the uh, one show is site specific. So I have to fly to Europe and I won't bring anything with me. And I have a general idea of what, I don't know exactly what materials are available, but the proposal I sent, the language, hopefully defines it. So sometimes I'll define what I'm doing by language, and then that opens up the opportunity, even in my own mind. Um, and then the other show is very small, so um, that is almost like a drawing for the, sh the first show is almost a drawing for the final one. That's like a year later, and I do that sometimes. I'm like. The iteration that I'm most interested in is the furthest away and how do I get there? So I'll sometimes practice through the shows to the one that I really like. Um, but um, I've become skilled at scheduling because of my theater background. So I know materials well. And if I don't know them well, I'll inquire for someone to teach me about them. And, um, and I really like organizing it in that way. I like calendars. And when I'm in the process, it looks messy, but it's actually um, like I know with the materials, I know what force they can take, how long it'll take, and possibly how many people I might need to help me. There's a lot of learning involved that it's not perfect. So um, as a career counselor here at a premier art school in New York City, I get a question. I, I'm lately have been getting this question quite a bit. Do I have to live in New York City to be successful as an artist? And <laughs> I love that neither of you live here full time. Um, so I wonder if you can talk about what you think the answer to that question is. Well, Julie moved to Grand Rapids from Brooklyn, so that answers your question. Um, obviously not. I mean, let's face it, uh, this is the center of, of the art world currently anyways, and it has been for a little while, or, or at least as Jerry Seltz likes to say, it's the trading room floor uh, for the art world. Um, I was terrified to leave. I thought I would never leave. I mean, I, on many occasions, uh, 
uh, you know, told people around me that that I love and and that I hang out with that I am never moving from this place. And certainly, I would never move back to the Midwest. And I've now been there for ten years, and these opportunities kept sort of arising. Um, you know, I just finished up working on a two-year project collaboration with Habitat for Humanity, where they let. Um, my organization used four acres, 11 buildings, and we got to do whatever we wanted. Uh, we paid zero in rent. Um, the only thing we paid w were utilities on these properties. Um, uh, I raised over, oh, probably $300,000 in that two years to do this, these massive projects. There is no way I could do these projects uh, like I just did at Rumsey Street in Manhattan, in, in New York City, anywhere. Um, it, it would be millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars, and I would have to know people in the mayor's office and be super connected politically. Um, in, in Grand Rapids, in the middle of the Midwest, I can pull off these big, crazy projects that um, you can r really can't do anywhere else. Um, so certainly you can survive outside of of this region, I, th I had to sort of reinvent myself when I moved there, and I sort of had to create uh, the opportunities for myself in the beginning. Um, uh, I was certainly terrified to move away from this region. Um, I will probably end up back here at some point in my life, I hope, um, but I think there are strategies to survive uh, here as well as elsewhere. It's true, I've seen um, incredible stuff happen with Paul's organization and um, the, f like the fact of how much you've been able to raise in a short period of time. It's, it's pretty, it's unbelievable. It's like what we fantasize about as artists, being able to have freedom to do these things and that be like, I have to go through this and this and this and I have to be 50 <coughs> years old to be able to do a project like this. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was I was just thinking about us as a collective, like at SVA or artists in New York, is um, one thing I like to think about is all of us as, some of us might be native to the area, but we're still immigrants in this art school, in this region, and that takes a lot of skill to bring yourself here, even if you're an English-speaking native of the country like we all have the drive to do something interesting and I think that that is really important and that is what um, propels us forward like going out back into um, the Midwest where I'm originally from and realizing that it's the adventure that we're after whether it be whether it's here or somewhere else or sending your work out to somewhere in the world it's that sense of adventure and presentation that we're excited about. So like, you can do what you want. You can do this, you can go somewhere else for a while, and many of you probably have. Um, so I just think about that as something as artists that is native to our abilities. Um, in terms of art practice, um, yeah, I, I lived in New York, I was here eight years. Um, and I had a job in production, and then slowly, as Anna was saying, like my life turned over to full-time artist, and it happened very gradual, and I actually kind of made a choice, like this is important enough, this is how I do it, this is the financial losses, um, and then I'm like, and then it's hopefully gonna even out, and, um, but there were times where I'd take a trip with a friend, like from here to Chicago, stop in Detroit and I was like, oh, no way, never, never, no way. And I was there yesterday giving studio crits at um, the uh, College for Creative Studies and I'm like, how did this happen? Like, and it's adventure and it's amazing and it's just this part of my life, it's not permanent either. Like, that's what's amazing is as long as you start thinking it's permanent, then you're stuck. But seeing our network as artists, as global, as across this country, that I think that's what really opens up your possibilities. Um, going back to what you were discussing about um, you creating this site lab and everything, do you believe that uh, by creating something, it helped to propel your career? Like rather than just going home, creating work, 
waiting on a gallery to call you? Do you believe that by you creating this event, creating this idea, that it then drew other people to you? Or do you think um, there's a different way? That's exactly what happened. Um, you know, by, by creating this thing, um, it created momentum for other opportunities to come my way. And um, I think it was, I think it was two, two years ago, a year and a half ago, my f it w I had my first show on the East Coast uh, since moving away, but it was because of all the activity that I created there. And, and, and these sort of large scale projects that I'm able to produce uh, in a region that maybe doesn't get a lot of critical attention. Um, uh, with the exception of this sort of crazy art prize thing that happens once a year in, in that area. Um, but it, you know, so one time out of the year, the eyes of the art world sort of turn on Grand Rapids for this art prize thing. Um, and I sort of saw it as an opportunity to exploit. And I started producing much larger projects for that event. And um, certainly that created opportunities that drew attention uh, uh, attention of other people to to my practice and ha has created opportunities outside of the region for me certainly hello um, I had a quick question um, as far as how you guys separately are applying for things because what I'm hearing on Paul's end is more like an organizer um, of a bigger institution or a bigger organization and then um, on Julie's end she's still ahead of a bigger project but it still requires multiple people within it um, so our my question would be are you guys people um, applying to things that are for groups or for individuals um, for LOCs nonprofit or um, um, businesses like how 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 and what are you applying your energy to to um, to fund your projects um, so so site lab is an all-volunteer nonprofit arts organization um, and uh, so often those grants and fundraising efforts are for for those projects I'm also doing them for my individual you know sort of when I do independent projects which is less and less often. I mean, really, I think of my practice as, as sort of all-encompassing in, in, even in sort of running or producing these large-scale projects. Um, but yeah, most of my effort on the fundraising side is uh, through the nonprofit side of this deal. Or that's where, maybe a better way to answer it is that's where the fund, more funds are available. Um, so I have two responses to that. Um, there's two ways I've been writing grants. One is specifically under myself as an individual. Um, the other is um, ideas I have to work as with a group of people. And but it's it's not a nonprofit. It's not an LLC. I haven't um, thought that way. But. Um, the success that I've had as an artist, and I, I think I shared today sometimes, um, is that when you have a very compelling, um, driven statement about how passionate you are about making your work, why you're making your work, who you're making your work for, and how it's going to impact, who it's going to impact, people want to hear about that. And, um, sometimes people who are reading your application are not artists. A percentage of them won't be, and they want to know that your their money isn't just going to go to your studio rent. So that's what I found is when people say yes, I go back and I read my application. I was like, oh, I sound compelling, like, <laughs> and then some. Oftentimes, I've said promised portions of the money to someone that's helping me, or somebody that I've stated as valuable in my practice, and then they also see that as as a good move. Um. Um, to her point, it's um, when I go uh, and fundraise through the organization, um, people like to fund th 
the artistic project. They don't want to. So, so for instance, about 95 to 98 percent of all the funds we raise go directly to the projects, to the artistic projects. Um, we don't pay rent, you know. So the so the money I'm raising isn't going to pay for a brick and mortar space it's not paying for uh, you know uh toilet paper or anything else it's going directly towards the projects and people love to give money to the artistic projects versus you know uh salaries or you know rent as julie said things like that so it's easier to raise money that way find something else too sorry um other grants i've gotten have been over arching from other organizations um, like the Harpo Foundation, um, you, there is a, a clause for you to apply as an individual to that grant, which would probably be perfect for you. Uh, it's for women. A lot of women get it. Um, not just women, but they generally, you can understand my point. Um, so, but it was also under the Mattress Factory the Museum in Pittsburgh, which um, I had to write the statement, but they presented it forward. So sometimes that works out really well if you have an organization, and I'm, I'm not quite sure how you would line that up. But <laughs> yeah, I just. I want to thank you both so much for coming all the way out here, for being here and sharing your stories. Um, I've gotten to know both of you over the last you know, year or two, um, and I've been inspired by your stories. Um, I think we got a lot of really good advice tonight. Um, just go for it when you're feeling awkward. Uh, be open to new opportunities, take adventures, um, get other people to help you, find your people. I think all of this is useful to every kind of artist, no matter what your trajectory is. So um, thank you both so much for being here. Introduce our two guests this evening, and while I give you their um, their bios, I'm going to show you some slides of their work, um, of their practice, and then we'll uh, sit down and have a conversation about what it really takes to create a sustainable arts practice. Because our two guests both um, are able to live off of their creative practices, so um, they're not doing a day, jo day job; they're you know essentially living the dream. So we want to hear about how they've done this in very very different ways. Okay, so let me just launch into some slides here. Okay. Um, so first, Julie Schenkelberg grew up in the post-industrial landscape of Cleveland, Ohio. Her mixed media installations start with furniture, dishware, textiles, and marble, combined with concrete, resin, and construction materials to transform notions of domesticity and engage with the American Rust Belt's legacy of abandonment and decay. Using the home as a playground for formal and conceptual subversions, the work aggressively disrupts cohesion within the physical sphere. Familiar furnishings rekindle memories or premonitions of collapse, suggesting both the utter destruction of war, calamities, or urban decay, but also the uncanny juxtapositions of fragile substances such as cloth and china with industrial materials such as rusty metal, heavy concrete, and tool-made marks like drilled holes and chainsawed indentations which she does entirely herself, I have to add. Um, Schenkelberg was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and splits her time between the Midwest and New York. She received a BA in Art History at the College of Worcester in Ohio, an MFA uh, and an MFA in Fine Arts here at SVA. She's represented by Asia Geisberg Gallery in New York, and her large-scale installations have been displayed in solo exhibitions at the Sculpture Center, the Mattress Factory Museum of Contemporary Art in Pittsburgh, which this image is from, um, Untitled Art Fair in Miami, Sight Lab in Grand Rapids, and many more. She's received numerous grants from institutions including the Harpo Foundation, the Fry Foundation, Art Prize, the Slavic Village Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts, and has been a finalist for both the Joan Mitchell Foundation grant and the Knight Foundation grant. In 2014, she was awarded the $20,000 Jury Prize for Installation Art at Sight Lab and was just recently announced as the 2016 Ephraim Sind Contemporary Arts Fellow, a distinction that carries with it an award of $25,000. She's been an artist in residence at the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art, the Mattress Factory, the Myers School of Art at the University of Akron, and Oxbow. 
She's been visiting faculty at a number of institutions, including Rutgers University, Kendall College of Art and Design, the University of Akron, um, and is currently uh, on faculty at the College for Creative Studies uh, in Detroit. Coming up in 2017, she will have solo exhibitions at Projectrum Normans in Norway, Plug Projects in Kansas City, and Asia Geisberg in New York. And these are just a few more images from the recent piece that Julie did at SciLab with Paul. Paula Menta was born in Hammond, Indiana, and attended Grand Valley State University, where he received a BA in sculpture and printmaking, sorry, BFA. He then earned an MFA in fine arts at the School of Visual Arts. He spent eight years here in New York and was represented by Marvelli Gallery. Amenta then returned to Grand Rapids in 2006, where he served as an adjunct professor at Kendall College of Art and Design, an experience that directly led to his forming the nonprofit Site Lab, a curatorial initiative that brings together outstanding installations, sculpture, and performance artists to create site specific works using abandoned structures in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Site Lab works closely with Habitat for Humanity to transform spaces and buildings slated for demolition. SiteLab recently received the Art Prize Award for Outstanding Venue for the fifth year in a row, woohoo! And his own piece, Hybrid Structures, in this year's uh, iteration, a collaborative piece created with artist Alois Kronschleiger, another SVA alum, and Ted Lott, was a finalist in the Art Prize Juror Shortlist for installation. His creative practice has grown to include organizing large collaborative exhibitions and vacant structures in Tonight, we have a conversation with two graduates of this program, the MFA Fine Arts Program at SVA, Julie Schenkelberg and Paul Amenta. The conversation will be moderated by Anna Osier Bloomer, who's Assistant Director of Career Development here at SVA. Anna was raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. Ooh, Ohio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she got an MFA in Photography and Related Media from Parsons and a BFA from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where she was the recipient of the Yusuf Karsh Prize in Photography. She's exhibited at galleries and museums nationally, including the Bridge Art Fair in Miami, the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and at the Attleboro Arts Museum in Massachusetts. Her solo and two-person shows include uh, exhibitions in New York, Cincinnati, and Wellesley, Mass. She's received grants from Cheshama in New York, the School of the Muse Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and CS Arts in Cincinnati. Her work's been published in Feature Shoot, Refinery29, Huffington Post, Bust Magazine, The Daily Mail, Red Book Magazine, and numerous other online publications. Anna's on the graduate faculty uh, at SVA, and she has been an adjunct assistant professor at uh, CUNY, City University of New York. Please join me in welcoming Julie Schenkelberg, Paul Amenta, and Anna Osher Bloomer. Thank you, Mark. Um, thanks for letting me take over your class tonight. Thank you so much to your amazing staff, Allison, Pam, and Aya, um, for helping me put this together tonight. So um, tonight, I know some of you are students in the class, some of you are um, other guests. We're so excited that you're all here tonight. Uh, we're changing the format a little bit of the usual artist talk. Um, so I'm going to introduce in Grand Rapids, including active site projects, Michigan Land of Riches, and the numerous site lab projects. Amenta's work and site lab has, have been acknowledged in publications such as the New, York, the New Yorker, the New York Times, Art Forum, Art News, Art in America, Art Net, Hyperallergic, High Fructose, Sculpture Magazine, The Creators Project, Art Journal, and many more. Um, recently, Amenta received a grant from the Fry Foundation and a major grant from the National Endowment of the Arts Our Town program, which will be used to support Site Lab's educational initiatives. So, I'm very thrilled to have the two of you here, and let's, uh, let's have a conversation. Yeah. As many of you know, we're going to be using these mics, and they're not projecting our voices. Uh, it's a fake mic, so <laughs> we're going to speak very loudly so everyone can hear us. Um, and after we've had a bit of a conversation, we'll open it up to audience questions. So we do want to hear from you. And when that happens, we'll be sure to pass this mic. You do need to, to use that. 
Um, so just to get the conversation started off, since we do have a lot of current students or very fresh uh, students, uh, recent graduates in the room, um, can you talk a little bit about what that experience was like leaving graduate school and kind of how the, the next several years were formative for you or what, how your, your career kind of um, progressed? Well, I was thinking a lot about that question because I, I came to SVA as an older student, and so I was in my mid-30s, and I came with an exper a eclectic experience of being out in the work world, having had an art history degree. And um, one thing was, was that I already had a skill that I could make use of after grad school. Um, I'm trained as a professional set painter for theater, so I went straight into production as soon as I got out of school, and um, I knew that it was going to be a rocky first year, so most of that time I spent making money and trying to make enough money to find a studio, um, and that was, that was the serious transition out of school, and a lot of my pra art practice as an artist began thinking, is this the place where I belong? Where do I make my work? Is my work about me and not where I make it? And those were questions that I began to develop, including applying to everything I saw. That, that was also something. Uh, first, thanks for having us here. Thank you to Anna for inviting us. And uh, it was a pleasure to meet some of you today in your studios. Thanks for inviting us. Um, for me, uh, that sort of crucial moment of coming out of grad school, um, out of SVA, which was uh, a really formidable time for me. Um, I think back to this very unique moment where um, I no longer had the studio uh, here at school. Um, I was also, um, you all know JP, right? Um, uh, I studied with him, we were, uh, we were students together, but uh, we also were coworkers. I spent uh, uh, just over two years sharing that little office with him, um, so I got to know him very well. Um, but in that moment of transition, so I got picked up by Marbella Gallery right out of grad school, which was exciting and, and amazing, um, but I didn't have a studio. So I would work from nine to five in that office, and uh, when JP would leave, um, I would push all of our desks together. Uh, Mark's uh, uh, predecessor, David Shirey, who was our chairman, I would push all three of our desks together, and that would be my studio. And I uh, co-opted that space for uh, about a year. Um, I produced two shows inside that, s in s inside that little office space up there. So that was my transition out of, uh, out of grad school. So um, I think the moral of that story is you do whatever it takes you know, to make the work. I think that's a, a really good point that you, you do have to do whatever it takes. And both of you have done that in so many ways. So um, what are the ways in which you've been able to now sustain your practice over the last several years? Um, how did those methods lead to new work that you've made or new opportunities?